Fishing the DMV is close to hitting our first major milestone on Patreon of 100 Patreon subscribers. We are only 38 Patreon subscribers away from hitting this first milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, you will receive 5% off every order you get from Jake's Bait and Tackle. You'll be entered to win weekly prize giveaways, tons of private content only for our Patreon supporters. You'll be able to vote on new topics, where the show goes, and so much more. We are only 38 Patreon subscribers away from hitting our first major milestone of 100 subscribers as we get closer and closer to our overall goal of starting a nonprofit to help stock our local waterways. If you feel like you can help support the show, I would greatly appreciate it. Check out the link down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. You go to the Richmond show, you go to any expo or iCast, and, and guys, you know, and this is kind of the intro I'm doing today, is I'm here with uh, Les Gray, who runs the Richmond Fishing Expo and much more. And I just want to get a glimpse behind the industry because I've gone to iCast, I've gone to a slew of expos, including uh, the Richmond Fishing Expo. But I, I don't think I ever ask questions like, how do you go from this empty slot to it being packed and then having everyone there completely ready to go by Friday morning, at least for the Richmond fishing expo by Friday morning. And then it has to be completely cleaned out by Sunday night. The fact that you still have hair is insane. Yeah. Well, it is thinning, but uh, you know, and then you throw a couple of other elements into it. It gets even thinner, but yeah, I mean, there's, you know, people just don't really think about the back end of, of events like this. And you're right. You, you mentioned ICAST. ICAST is more of an industry type of thing. You know, it's more a little bit global on the, the actual industries that come into the, and it's, it's you know, merchandising and things like that. It's not the consumer side of it, which is what we feel so blessed to be a part of is the actual consumer show where the guys that, that are using the product day in and day out come into these events. So, yeah, we, we start out and we, we obviously rent the facility. We're, we're a private company that does that. It's not a state ran facility or, you know, anything like that. So we rent the facility and then on paper, we break it down into uh, different size spaces. And, and um, then we just go out and I don't want to say beat the bushes because we have so many exhibitors that return with us from year in year out. Uh, but, you know, we try to keep the show fresh and, and keep the product that's provide, you know, that's offered to the public, the, the most relevant things in the industry. And uh, so, yeah, that's what that's what our job is, is to make sure that the people that say at the show is relevant to uh, what the attendees are coming to look for. So, how, how long have you been doing this for? And let me ask actually a better question. How did you get into this? Well, it's family business. My father started this business in the 70s. Oh, wow. uh, we're based in North Carolina. Uh, early 70s. He was involved in, in radio promotions and uh, radio promotions back then. They would do these offsite sales for some of their advertisers. And my father was part of that process of, you know, doing these little offsite events. Hmm. Uh, some of the boat dealers in the Charlotte market, Charlotte, North Carolina market, came to him after one of those events and said, hey, we want to get together and do a boat show in Charlotte uh, in February. And we'd like, because of working with you a little bit, you know, we'd like to work with you on, on doing that. So in 1973, the Mid-Atlantic Boat Show in Charlotte was born. Wow. And we just celebrated our 50th anniversary on that event this past year. That's crazy. Um, so, yeah. And then my, I've got, I had an older brother. Actually, I've, I've lost my father and my brother both. And uh, we've all worked together. But um, we just, you know, we've been doing it for, for, I've been in it since I was, well, I grew up in the industry, obviously, with hustling tables and chairs whenever they needed it. But uh, I started full time in 85. Wow. So I've been in it for, you know, going on 40 years. And, how, uh, how many shows have you run? I mean, you just, you we, had the we, one in North Carolina. We do. We do uh, nine shows a year, and most yeah. of them are in the boating industry, boating and fishing industry. And then we have one Christmas show uh, similar to the uh, Bazaar Bazaar that's held in Richmond every year. Mm. Uh, you know, just a, a holiday Christmas gift show. And we've been doing it for like, getting close to 40 years on that show as well. Uh, so, yeah, we do nine events a year. Uh, the Mid-Atlantic Boat Show is the longest running one that we have. And then we do one in Greensboro, a boat show there. Uh, we do the fishing show in Raleigh, which is our kind of our sister show to this Richmond show that you're that mm. we're going to be talking about. And then uh, we do a fall boat show and a boat show in, in, in Chantilly and then a boat show at the raceway in Richmond. So 
You've been around a while through this industry, the boating industry in particular. What have been some of the changes that you've seen? Well, the evolution of boating? a lot of changes, and, and we're seeing some of them even right now. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's like any industry. You have your peaks and valleys. Um, COVID was is obviously a huge peak and valley in that, in that industry. But, you know, the economy is, is such a you know, huge factor of, of, you know, how the industry runs. Um, and so, you know, you will have these big peaks that we can go back in time and we can look in the 80s, you know, the mid 80s, such a strong sales process in, in those time, that time period. Uh, and then we come into the early 90s and that kind of, you know, dip down and then back up in the mid 90s. <laughs> so it is that riding the wave, so to speak, of the industry and any boat dealer will tell you that, um, you know, it's it's the, the public, what, what the economy is, what the public is looking for, you know, back in the day, the the family runabout, which is like the bow rider, was so huge and popular. Uh, then pontoons came into the, you know, the big spotlight forefront of that industry and, and has been for a good while now. But now the, the wakeboard industry has just gotten so strong. Um, really? You know, the wakeboard industry, the, the technology side of that is what's really gotten that kind of going crazy. It's because it's there's so much audiovisual elements that's put into the wakeboard industry now in the boats. Um you know, that newer generation, that's what they want. And that's what that's what the industry is giving them. So, yeah, there's just a lot of peaks and valleys in the industry. And, um, you know, the, the fishing industry, though, and I don't, I don't want to say thankfully, but it's just it's a very constant thing just because everybody, everybody that's, that supports that industry as far as the, the customer base, they just love to fish. You know, they don't they don't care if they're, you know, if they're out on a, a hundred thousand dollar bass boat or, you know, Twenty thousand dollar John boat. It, they just love to fish, and that's what they're that's coming out to do is is uh, learn about fishing and see what's new in the industry. You brought up wake boats, and I want to circle back to that because I think that is fascinating. Yes. That that is kind of what the newer generation wants. But you 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 hit on pontoons. I never thought about that, like when that became a thing, because I've always just thought like pontoon boats were always a thing that people got. Like wh right. what what made those things hot? Just the amenities that got put on those boats. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you look back, you know, in our day or my day, I mean, I'm a little bit older than you are, but in my day, you know, pontoon was just a flat board. Yeah. <laughs> lack of a better word, describe it, you know, with some seats on it and you put it around the, sh the, the lake on it, you know, grandma and grandpa were on it, you know, they were the ones sitting there watching it. But man, I mean, you go to a show now and you see some of the pontoons and they've got twin 300s hanging off the back of them, Jeez. you know, and they're, wow. they're tritunes and there's, you know, there's multi-level and there's kitchenettes on them. And it's just, it's the RV for the water. I mean, that's what it is now. So, um, you know, as, as they're in my generation, you know, in the, that 50 to 60 range age bracket, as they move, evolved through the, the family runabouts and, you know, the fishing boat stuff, they looked at that comfort and luxury and said, well, you know, that looks pretty nice. <laughs> so, um, so that's what kind of blew that industry kind of wide open was the amenities they started putting on these boats and the audiovisual side of it, uh, you know, a huge part of the, the pontoons too, because some of these stereo systems on the, on the pontoons are, you know, better than you have in your car. <clears throat> but, um, our pontoons, plus the ability, oh, the I'm sorry, ability continue. to wakeboard and, and, you know, inner tube behind them, you know, because of the, the, the uh, power that's being put on the boats now. Are, 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 are pontoon boats a regional thing? Or are they pretty much a hot seller all over the United States? No, pretty much all over the United States. Um, if you look at the industry, you know, there's the, the National Marine Manufacturer Association, which is a pretty big watch group for, for that industry. Um, if you look at their numbers, pontoons have really been probably probably that, that top selling uh, factor for several years now. Hmm. Um and then your fishing industry comes in right after that, if not, you know, right there with it, um, especially the last several years. Uh, but that's pretty much across the, across the, the nation. That's you know? interesting. Yeah. That's wow. That's really interesting. Yeah. And the wake boats, though, that's a hot item, I think, in just the fishing world, too, with, with those getting more popularity. Those things are insanely expensive, though. I mean, good Lord, those things are fancy. They are. Yeah, they are. Uh, it's it's, you know, it's. Some would say that that industry has kind of gotten themselves out of a, out of a, you know, I don't want to say common man, but the, the, you know, the payment oriented person that looks to have that, that boat. Um, it's, it's a tough, it's some of the pricing is kind of tough, but it, but there again, they're, they're so technology driven boats. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good, bad thing. You know, 
I've, for somebody that's on the outside looking into it, it's it's a great sector for that for uh, the industry, but it's it's kind of narrowing its it's uh, particularly right now it's narrowing its its customer base, and I think the industry is going to have to kind of look and and figure out how to how to uh, to correct that. How much so, of an how much of an impact do saltwater boats have on any of your expos? It, it, or do they oh, make up huge. a portion? Oh, they do. It is especially the Raleigh fishing show that I mentioned, the Bass and Saltwater Fishing Expo. Uh, we have we have two buildings for that event. It's 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 actually the weekend before the Richmond show, and we're at the North Carolina Fairgrounds there. We have two buildings. One building is just all boats, and it's ninety thousand square feet of nothing but boats. Holy moly! Uh, wow. And it's because of that the coastal influence that we have in that Raleigh market. Mm. Uh, so we've got a lot of coastal dealers that come up, and we've got boats up to forty foot display there, uh, offshore stuff. So. Uh, for the Raleigh market in particular, the, the saltwater influence is huge. And then, you know, you, you can kind of skew that saltwater, um, I guess, that saltwater sector. When you start getting into the bay boats, you know, the, tw- the trailable bay boats with this, I'm saying 25 down to, you know, 19 center consoles, things like that. Um, they're now, they're more prevalent on the freshwater lakes than they are in, in, in the bays. I mean, they're still obviously very prevalent on bays, but because of striper fishing, cat fishing, uh, all that, it, you're seeing more and more of those on the freshwater, be it like Bugs Island, Lake Gaston, you know, James River, all those, you're seeing more of those come in. So that, uh, that type of, that type of boat, and when I say that, meaning like bay boats, um, are huge, huge in the market right now. And I never, they're very, they're very yeah. reasonable. They're very reasonable priced, you know? Yeah, like the pricing is very reasonable. And I just never would, you hit the nail on the head with like the striper and the catfish guys um, who I feel like as, as bass anglers, you forget about that market demographic and how much they actually eat up of the market. Um, boy, that makes so it's, much and sense. And it's becoming even more. Yeah, it's even more so. I mean, catfishing industry is, is just, has gotten just, he's gone way above anything here lately. Uh, you know, the technology and the rods and the reels and the and the, the, the way people are catfishing. Now, you know, in my day, you sat on the bank, you threw a rod out, and you waited yep. for the fish to come by and pick up. Now, I mean, they're drift fishing for catfish. They're live bait fishing. They've been doing all kinds of stuff in catfishing. Oh, I and, saw a, uh, I saw a video the other day about a guy using live scope to specifically target catfish, and I've never heard of such a thing. Absolutely, and it's like I said, a lot of that's drift fishing, drift fishing, and and uh, yeah, I mean, and those guys are just catching stupid sized fat bit, uh, fish too. You know, 50, 60, 70 pounders are. You know, if you don't catch one of those now, when you when you really target catfish, and you've you've had a, you hadn't had a good day. <laughs> but what's what's the biggest catfish you've ever caught? Uh, biggest catfish I've ever caught is twenty six pounds. Yeah, that was, and that's small. That's like I said, I'm, and I love to catfish. You know, I'm not a I'm not a bass fisherman. I love to catfish, but I don't have the time, you know, to to do it as much as I'd love to. But we went down to Santee Cooper down in South Carolina, which is a big fishery down there, catfish. And uh, and just had a blast. We were catching, you know, twenty pounders pretty much all day. And and you know they always talk about that what they what they in this industry call a CPR, which is catch, photo, and release. Mm-hmm. You know these big cats because they want to keep those big cats out there for you know for the for the system and keep them keeping uh, you know new fish coming along. Uh, but in that you know if you get that five, six to 15, 16, 17 pound range, you know those are your meat fish. Those are the ones that stay in the cooler and go home with you. And so, would you say the blue cat or the flathead or the channel is like the most popular one down near you? Oh, it's it's blue cat. I mean, that's the one that's most prevalent. Uh, you know, if you if you catch a nice channel cat, then you 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 feel pretty good. But uh, blue cats are kind of the one that's most prevalent. Yeah, it's those are the ones that man, when they hit, they go. You know, they're going they're going to take you for a ride a little bit to get to get in a boat. So. You got some great fisheries for that down there. I mean, you, man, you, you really do. And, and that's, what's interesting is to see the evolution of this industry. And when we talk about like evolution. I, I think we got to really take the story back. Like, cause there is a separation between before COVID and then after COVID and, and just for what you do running these events. Um, I, I want to first, before we talk about the COVID thing, I'm going to set the stage. What happens for you to create an event? And then we're going to get into like how COVID affected that. Like how, how does this work behind the scenes for you? Yeah, well, I mean, we pretty much start in the spring, and that's why I say the spring, the, in the late spring, early summer, reaching out to the exhibitors, particularly the ones that have done the show with us in the past. They do get first opportunity to renew their booth. Uh, we start working with them, and a lot of them, you know, get larger booths. Sometimes they, you know, they, they were so successful the year before, they need a little bit more room in the booth for, for 
customers to come in, so they'll get a little larger. So we give them first option, you know, we give them first dibs of, of the floor, basically floor location, floor space size, all that kind of stuff. So those are, those are guys that support us year in, year out. We want to make sure we take care of them. Uh, then as we go along and later into the spring, into the uh, fall, we start opening up to new exhibitors and we start reaching out to people that we think would be a great asset to the show uh, that would be, that would do well. You know, our goal is not to, not to just fill spaces, but we want to make sure the people that fill the space have a good event and it's worth their, their investment because that's what they're doing. They're investing. Uh, so, um, so that's pretty much, that starts it. Now during that time also, we've got reaching out to our pro anglers to try to get these mm. guys, you know, scheduled to be, uh, to be at the show. And that, that's a tough, that's gotten to be a tough thing now, particularly with the two, the two major fishing tours that are out there. They're almost on top of each other now, you know, on t- uh, tournament dates. And of course, that's what these guys do for a living. So they're, they're going to be at these tournaments rather than, you know, being at the events. Of course, they, they want to be at the events because they, they want to be out, uh, you know, around the, the people and, and, and pitch product. I mean, cause that's what their sponsors, you know, bring them on board to, to try to, you know, sell their products and stuff like that. Um, but th- that gets that. So that's kind of mixed into that s- space selling element is, is getting the, the uh, features, what we consider features. And those are your Bass Pros, the Bass Tub. We got to get it, uh, you know, scheduled. The fishing, the little trout fishing tank, you know, for the kids, we get it scheduled. Um, we start working with the decorator on the show floor as far as the pipe and drape. When you see stuff, you know, when you see a booth, it's basically constructed out of curtain backdrops and, and separators from booth to booth. And um, so it's a lot of people that, that there's a lot of hands that, that get into these things. You know, it's not just, just one person you? sitting here doing it. Is it just you or how many people do you have working on this? Well, I mentioned my older brother. My, my father had passed away in, in 2014. Uh, he was obviously the, he worked up until the, the day passed. And it, um, so my, my older brother and myself have been doing it uh, about, about the same time. Well, he, he, we lost him in April. And mm. uh, so right now, it, it as far as, um, you know, I guess the, the, the management team, it is me. I've got That's two great, excuse me, three great staff people that work with us every day. Wow. Uh, then I've got one gentleman up in the Richmond, in the Richmond area that um, works with us kind of on contract basis that works with us directly on these fishing shows. And just it's a huge, huge part of what we do uh, as far as the booth, the booth sales. And um, so, I mean, the, the booth vendors really call upon him now instead of calling us directly. They'll call, call on him. And, uh, but in his own right, he does other events in that market, RV shows and home shows. So, you know, this fishing show is kind of a side, little side venture for him, but, uh, such a great guy to work with and does a great job for us, but full-time staff is four of us and, uh, two ladies, they work in the office year round and, and keep, keep me sane, keep me level and keep me organized. Uh, then we've got another gentleman that works with us as far as boat dealers, uh, boat dealer representative you know, working with directly with our boat dealers. And, and so uh, four to five people and you're running four to five different shows, or I'm sorry, you had nine shows a year. That's shows, yeah. insane. The amount you're juggling. Good Lord. Six, six shows within a, uh, within a two and a half month period. So the, the logistics gotta be a nightmare. I mean, they, they, I mean, they, they are, but like I said, the more you do it, the more you kind of know when you need to do stuff as you go along. It's just like any job or any industry. You, you kind of, if somebody tried to jump in the middle of it, they'd go, what the heck is going on? But uh, you just, you know, you, you know, timing when you need to do certain things and get certain things done. Um, but it's um, our, our deal is and everybody's like, well, you only work two and a half months a year. I'm like, no, when we, <laughs> once we start start these shows, our job better have been already finished, which is happening from really May until December. Mm-hmm. You know, as we were getting those all those plans done, because once we start that first event in January, we're just theoretically traffic directors trying to get the the vendors in and out of the building so that they're not, you know, not having help being held up and, and, you know, wasting their time, having downtime, getting that done. Uh, Cause like you said, Friday morning, when you open that door, it's gotta be there, you know, Um, it's gotta be there. One thing I think a lot of people, you know, might find interesting is, is, and you, you mentioned this a little bit before is the professional angler and they got a busy schedule. Like, when you're trying to book them, because that's something that in every show you try to have a promotion, are you trying to have that locked up by October of the previous year, July? I would, like- love, I would love to have it done by October, but that's, and that kind of goes back to these scheduled tournament schedules that I referenced. 
Yeah. Um, the, the pros can't really do any type of personal uh, commitments until all the schedules come out for the tournaments. So, and that normally happens in that October, you know, mid October time frame. Um, and now that there's two major tournament trails, you know, those we've got to wait till both of them are out before we can really narrow in who we're going to get. We start conversation uh, early to let them know that hey, we'd love to be able to work with you. So if, if things, you know, if once the schedule comes out, please remember us. You know, and trying to get a date. And a lot of times we like to do two day a two day appearance, either okay. Friday, Saturday, or Saturday, Sunday. Um, sometimes you're only being able to do one day. In the event, for, for instance, our Raleigh show, we've got Kevin Van Dam coming in Friday, just for Friday only appearance, which is great. I mean, we'd love we'd love to have him. We had him in Richmond a few years back. Um, so, you know, those guys, you just kind of take what you can get and uh, and get them locked in when you can. From a scheduling yeah. perspective, then, with so many pros, do you just have a list in your head of, like, these are the guys I want this year and yeah, I'll reach uh, them first? You do. I mean, you know, there's there's legends in this industry, like any any industry like that. Um, and you always – those names always come up. Uh, okay. Shaw Grigsby, you know, uh, Kevin Van Dam, Jay Yell. I mean, there's just so many history – you know, Larry Nixon – you know, all those guys are, are just legends, you know, they're Hall of Famers, they're legends. So if you can, if you can get one of those guys and they're great to, to put on, put on your, um, you know, your, your schedule for the seminars or for just parents as far as that goes, but you got to stay fresh too. You got to, you got to get the guys that are, that are on the tournaments each, you know, week in, week out. Um, you know, the, the newer generation are coming up now and, you know, they, they've heard of these legends names, but they don't you know, they don't know the history of them, but they know these guys that are, they're, you know, promoting products now and being out on the, on the waters and in, in these tournaments. Matt Becker is a great example. He's going to be at the Richmond show this year with us. Uh, favorite rods is, is bringing him in. Um, Brian Thrift, huge guy in this industry. I mean, he's, he's been both BASS and, and MLF has done just phenomenal things on the, both of those trails. Uh, so he's going to be with us. Um, he just came off the Red Crest Championship, Red Crest Championship this past year. Uh, so wow. trying to get those guys that are very successful still on the tour, and and th those are the people that that the that, that the attendees the attendees want to see. They want to be able to talk to them, you know, take pictures with them. And so that's what we strive for is to, is to keep those guys that are, that are still very active and successful on the tours. It's so funny that you're giving yourself from, you know, May to December to get so much of the stuff set up, but then there's this wind sprint of between October and go time. That you December, have to yeah. Up. yeah. That's, Oh my God. Plus the holidays are there too. Yeah. I've always, uh, I've always kind of kidded myself that Christmas is kind of a line item on a to-do list. <laughs> it's like, Oh, tomorrow's Christmas. Okay. <laughs> let's get that done. Then I would keep on going. And, and sadly that is, that is kind of true. Uh, and my kids can attest to it. I've got two grown kids now, but growing up there again, I've been doing this 40 years growing up. It was just, you know, dad's dad's in show season, mm -hmm. you know, and, that, uh, that can be but tough. yeah, you're right. You just, you just, you, you got to kind of keep it, keep it going because once you get on the road in January, your stuff better have been done or you at least 95% completed. And you go uh, in a mix of light, you got signage. We got, you know, got oh, yeah. signage done for the shows, seminar schedules. We got to get um, uh, the program, show programs put together. Um, just working with the decorators on laying carpet. I mean, just a lot of, a lot of facets, but it, it's good. I mean, once, like I said, the more you do it, the easier it gets. So all that hustle and bustle, that whole lifestyle. And then 2020, 2021 happens. When this hit and you had that first, that first show season with the pandemic, what, what was going through your mind? What was happening? What were your thoughts going into it? Well, I, fortunately for us, our last event um, of the season was the weekend that COVID first started coming out in 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 the media. Oh wow! You know, there had been there had been a couple of you know a couple of uh, of cases come up on the West Coast. There, you know, it was in the converse, conversation of the media, but this was at the, the last weekend of February, uh, because at this time we weren't doing, we do two shows in Richmond, uh, one in, there again in, in February and then one in, in March. Uh, but we had just finished up our show in Greensboro, which was the, uh, the weekend, the last weekend of February, the very next weekend, that week from the last week of February to the first week of March was when everything just kind of exponentially grew, you know, build built around the, the country 
And uh, so for us in 2020, we had finished our season uh, yeah. when it all happened. Now, I will tell you, because I, I'm in, you know, in a group of uh, the National Association of Consumer Shows that is a lot of show producers around the country. I will tell you, they were events that were ready to open doors. Well, the Raleigh, the Raleigh Boat Show, for instance, there's a big boat show downtown Raleigh to get the convention center. They had all the dealers in place on, a, and the show was supposed to open up on Thursday. And the governor came out on Thursday and said that as of Friday, they were shutting down North Carolina. Wow. So they never got to open those doors and all the dealers had to come and get their product and take it back home. So that, and that was just, that was one story of many things that happened around the country. But I mean, it, you know, we all saw what happens. I mean, what do you do? You know, you, mm -hmm. it, it becomes trivial at that point when things were going like they were. But yeah, so for our industry, because, you know, you kind of got frowned upon by bringing a lot of big groups of people together. Yep. <laughs> You'd be around each other. Uh, for our industry, 18 months, we were shut down. Um, and it was it was devastating to some groups. I mean, fortunately, we were able to, to kind of weather it. Um, but for 18 months, you, you know, you didn't have any income at all. We tried to put events on in... 21 we reached out to the dealers we had kind of what we considered our quote covid plan every you know every business tried to put together some kind of plan you know uh to where we were going to monitor the number of people coming in the building um some some municipalities were going to require us taking temperatures as people came in the building which was you know which was really tough to do uh so we, we tried to put plans together like that but at the end of the day the dealers just didn't want to try to come out and bring their staff because i mean obviously they had staff they have to consider uh so yeah for uh for the from we didn't have any events the fall of 20 uh no events in 21 at all and then we came back slowly in 22 our first boat show in in um with the fishing expo in raleigh was our first uh, boat show of 22 wow. and it was to about half the vendors that we would normally have and, but we're, I mean, we're growing, but, you know, this year we're full house again, you know? So, I mean, every industry has a story of, of COVID and uh, just fortunately we were able to, to come through that. It is a weird one where with the COVID thing, how much it helped and hurt the, the outdoor industry, if that makes any yeah. sense. Um, oh yeah. And a lot of people, I, I just know, cause people are, humans are creatures of habit where you don't want to commute anymore to work. You know, remote became a thing and, and people didn't like to do these big interactions after COVID. And was there a worry at that time? Like what expos would look like in the future? Would people come back? Was that a worry at all? It was a, a big part of the conversation during the COVID time because some shows tried to go virtual, you know, which is, and I, you know, I don't want to say that I'm computer savvy, but I'm not illiterate either when it comes to computers. So I, I know a little bit about it to where, uh, you know, how to have things work like that. But to try to put on an event um, virtually is basically what people can do every day on the computer anyway. Does that mm, make sense? In other yeah. words, because you, you can get on and you can, you can look up boat brands and you can see all the models and you can watch videos and you can do all that kind of stuff. But the mystique and the, the uh, you know, the good thing about shows is people want to touch and feel and see and, you know, get up in and open up hatches and, you know, they want, they want to, they want to be a part of it. And, uh, and that just, that was, um, it was just impossible to do, you know, in a, in a hybrid, what they considered a hybrid event, which is online and being in person too. And, um, so yeah, it did change it. There was a little bit of fear that that was going to happen. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, we were seeing the, the, the crowds come back. Our, 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 um, Christmas show that I mentioned, we were back to pre COVID numbers on attendance this year. So That's it took fantastic. it took three years, but we're back to that point because you're right. P people are creatures of habit. They want to get out. They want to be a part of. The, you know, we we like being around people. You know, so and uh, especially when it comes to buying and you know, actually, of course, I know there's a lot of online sales that go on now, but most time stuff's done because they've seen it somewhere or they've you know their friend has it or something like that. So you got to feel it. You got to touch it. And, and that was a great segue to the next <clears> thing was. Your shows are sold out. They're, they're, they're doing great again, but then online sales are also at an all time high. How do you compare and contrast the two, how you can have both doing well? Yeah. Um, it's kind of hard to explain. It's, I don't know that I have, a, have an answer for it. 
you know, the one good thing for our shows is we have so many, we're, you know, our, our bases are mom and pop businesses, small businesses. They're, they're not these big online retailers. Um, you know, and that's what we promote is, you know, these are small businesses that, that want to talk the, the language to you. You know, you, you can go into some of these big boxes and walk up and down the aisles. But if you ask a question to one of the, the, the salespeople, they're not going to know the answer. You know, they're not going to know what's what's being caught on the lakes, you know, last weekend or what, you know, what the, the hottest lures are. These guys in these shops, you walk in, you know, you're going to spend an hour just talking about talking about the lakes and talking about what's going on. And, and then, and then you might buy some product, but that's the key to these, these shows and these events and uh, mom and pop groups is the fact that they know the industry, you know, that's, that's what the deal is. They, that's the biggest part of, of what we do. So um, I think, they'll, I mean, obviously we know they're always going to be online sales just because people look for value. But when you start really at the end of the day, looking at value, You've got to put a value on the knowledge that you gain at these at these events and talking to these mom and pop groups. Well said. Well so. said. Yeah, like that is so true. Because when you think regional, that's where you can really get into like examples. If you're on the Susquehanna River, you're going to get knowledge about the Susquehanna than anywhere else. And having these regional shows, that's where you get that value, guys, to come on down and you'll be able to extract that. Um, exactly. The other part of it is like how many guides and you probably don't like the percentage of just guides that actually get a booth or something like that. That's got to be a part of it as well. Yes, we, you know, we don't have as many as we, we'd like to have more, to be honest with you. But the guiding service has gotten or the guiding industry has gotten so big now. I mean, these guys, you know, they're they're guiding year round, especially, you know, on the rivers and stuff like that. So it's tough for them to want to take a whole weekend out of when they could you know, book three or four trips and you know come out but uh but we do have some great guides that's with us this year on the shows um got in fact uh tim king who is a, a, a catfishing guide on bugs island king's guide service he's he's gonna be doing some seminars with us this year so he's gonna be at the show cool. um we've got captain B uh bobby ball headed brewer i'll get it right there um he's a guy down the north carolina coast he's he's actually done some seminars for us in richmond for the last two th two or three years um he's gonna be there again so um, Jerry Dillsaver, Captain Jerry Dillsaver, he's a kayak uh, pro angler for Hobie, Hobie Kayaks. He'll be doing some seminars for us. He's a guy. So, you know, these, these, these guys see the value of the show. They know the value of the shows, but it, sometimes it does make them tough to, to uh, take a week out of their schedule when they're, when they're so active booking trips right now. And, uh, but I don't want to discount the, the value of a guide. You know, if, oh, no, if, no. if, if you want to get on a, a body of water and, and, and hopefully fish it, you know, long term. Man, a guy that's so much, so much knowledge, you know, and he, and these guys don't mind sharing that with you, mm -hmm. you know, so. No, that's, that's so true. And, and you mentioned, um, you know, a, a kayak professional. And when I went to ICAST two years ago, that's really when I saw like, oh my goodness, this kayak industry is becoming a thing. It's blowing <laughs> yeah. up. Is you've been in the boat world your whole life. What do you make of the whole kayak? Is it a boom? Is it a resurgence? Like what's going on? It's, I mean, it's, it's something that's definitely taken off. Uh, and there again, the industry has, has put, for lack of a better word, the bells and whistles and have, have created a way to put all these elements to these kayaks that's made them so functional in the fishing world. I mean, my gosh, you, you know, you can sit there with dual monitor electronics on your, on your <laughs> kayak. I mean, yeah. think about that. You're yeah. out there on a kayak and you've got dual, <laughs> dual uh, electronics, you know, forward facing sonars and all this it's kind insane. of stuff. Uh, and what blows my mind though is is seeing these guys do it on the on the saltwater side of that. Hmm. You know, they're taken out across the the surf in these kayaks, and once they break the surf, you know, they're going three four miles out in a kayak. Mm -hmm. It's <laughs> insane. Know, so, uh, it's just such a cool industry. I mean, particularly you know, it, obviously it's it's a it's a a cheaper way or a less a more valuable way of getting into the industry or getting into fishing and still have some really nice equipment, uh, but. Yeah, it's just a cool niche uh, industry that has just really taken off. Appomattox River Company, which is one of our exhibitors at the show, man, what a group of guys those are. I mean, you know, they they want they just want you to get out and be on a kayak. So you know, you let them know what your interests are. They're not going to try to sell you a big thing of goods. They're just going to say, okay, this man, this will work great for you. You know, and then once you get into it, then it's on you to start buying all the other stuff that goes with it. But that's human nature, you know. 
it it um, was definitely a boom of COVID, I think, where you saw the kayak, especially in Northern Virginia, Ashburn, where you don't have maybe a big garage for a brand new uh, Skeeter yeah. or, or big boat. That, that that industry really took off. But since you've had so much time in the industry, do you have a vibe of maybe what's coming next? Is it going to be the, like the aluminum boat craze, the small rigs? Like, what do you think is going to come next? If you could guess. Yeah, the aluminum, the aluminum industry is coming on. I don't know that I really know, kind of can predict on what, you know, the next fad is going to be, but uh, I think, and I made this, I made reference to this a little while ago. I think the industry really needs to kind of look at, you know, the, the, uh, the average customer, you know, and what they can afford and how they can afford it and, you know, what would be good and functional for them and how they how they can do that. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not on that, the manufacturing side of it, but um, yeah, just trying to keep it affordable is, is, a, is what the industry needs to do. And, and I think any, anything in the fishing industry that is affordable uh, to the consumer uh, will be a fad. I'll just leave it at that because that's, you know, as long as it gets them out on the water and gets them out fishing, uh, they're going to they're going to embrace it. You know, is, so that's what the industry's got to try to figure out. Is this the worst it's been price wise with inflation and everything within it comes to, you know, certain items for boats and stuff that you've seen? Yeah, I, I, I don't want to say the worst. I mean, I, you know, we all live in the times that we're in. True. So, um, yeah, inflation has done has done a good bit of it. Uh, I think the demand for the product, especially during COVID, because the, the boating industry went 360 degrees of what it thought it was going 180 excuse me of what it thought it was going to happen when the covid <clears throat> when covid you know started uh mm-hmm. you know the industry really thought they were going to just have all this you know surplus inventory and then it just totally went opposite and they caught them kind of with their pants down so to speak mm-hmm. um so i think the demand uh caused a lot of that pricing um that you saw that took place you know because they could get it. And I hate to say it that way, but that, you know, there was, there was so many people that it, it was definitely a seller's market at that point. People, you know, if you had a boat, you were going to sell it, you mm-hmm. know, uh, because there were so many buyers in the market at that point and that's so less inventory. So that kind of dictated a little bit of the pricing that we're at now. Uh, and, and that's why I say the industry has got to figure out how to not reverse that, but kind of soften that and, uh, and get back into a, you know, a, a price pricing, uh, structure that brings brings the, the average consumer back into it so that's that's some good information because yeah it's just that's always it, it always gets boiled down to a yelling match without people looking at the economics and like how all this works and i think if people spend a little time looking at that it would kind of make make a little bit more sense to them or i, I hope so anyways yeah well we're in an industry where the customer is not really forgiven very much you know they they have their mindset and and thankfully so i mean that's just the way you know and you know it kind of goes into the whole covid thing too there was a lot of opinions that went on during that in, during that time period especially in our customer base you know but and and so the pricing is definitely one of those things where the, the average customer they're they're letting the industry know now hey i can't support that i'm not going to support that and so that's what i think they, they the industry is going to have to get that figured out Mm. And one last thing, and this has always been, as a kid, I always wondered this, and this would be the best person to ask. Is there just one national company that tanks around bass and bluegill to all these damn shows? Like, how does that work? Yeah, to do what now? Sorry. I, I you know the big, part. you know, the big aquariums that the professionals get on top of? Oh, yeah. The, the bass tubs. Yeah. Is that just one company that drives around? Like, how does that <laughs> whole process work? There's only about three or four in the, in the country. Yeah. That, that huh. have those tanks. Uh, the group that we work with is, uh, the gentleman that had it before, his name was Chuck Devereaux. And, uh, he has since sold and retired and sold his business, but he had five tanks. Wow. Um, uh, so I think the current owner has three of them and I'm not sure if the other two got retired or if they got sold off, but there's a group out of New Jersey that has, uh, the hog trough. I don't know if you remember, have heard of her that name. That's yeah. kind of an industry name, the hog trough. Uh, but then the Oklahoma Bass Tub, which is what we have. And then um, there's another outfit out west, Midwest as well. I can't remember what the name of that group is. But, yeah, there's not very many of them, you know. And once 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 you get somebody that does your shows and, you know, have a good experience with you as far as a, a customer and all that stuff, then you try to get them booked each year because if not, you're going to lose your date. And, uh and it's, it's kind of one of those expectations when the when the attendees come to the show, they expect to see the bass tub. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it's 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 a great simulation tank for not only the vendors that are there, because we have a lot of pro staffers that will jump up there and, you know, and 
and pitch product and, and show product how it works. Uh, but it's a great backdrop for the pros, you know, for them to get up there and really show techniques and stuff like that. So good stuff. Yeah. I mean, Les, I mean, yeah, I mean, thank you so much for coming on tonight. I, I really appreciate it. Um, well, I appreciate the time, Thomas. I look forward to having you guys with us at the show this year. And so uh, I just kind of invite everybody to come out and come up and spend some time with Thomas. He'll be there with in a display and uh, talking fishing. And, and that's what this show is all about. It's getting out and just talking fishing. Absolutely. And then as always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about, including the dates of the Richmond Expo. You know, come on out. You can see me. You can see all the great vendors. Um, Les, again, thank you so much for your time. Like and subscribe to the channel, guys, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.